Sunday is not the Sabbath, and the true Sabbath is not a day. We talked about this last week. Many people will say, as we've said, that Sunday is the Sabbath. That is not true. Sunday is the Lord's day. He got up. We celebrate the fact that he got up. And it is the Lord's Day and the early church met on the first day of the week in honor of the Lord's Day. In the denomination in which I grew up, they said that the Catholic Church changed Saturday, the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. That is not true. I don't care what church does anything. We don't go by what a church did. We go by the word of God. Amen. Amen. So therefore, we're going to look at today, continue our study in the Sabbath and the law and understanding where we fit. Because if you put on the wrong size shoe, you're going to be hurting. Right? You got to have on the right garment. You got to understand who you are. And when you understand who you are, then you will be able to have the freedom to be who God intended you to be in him. No, the law has not changed. This is what Jesus said about the law in Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Fulfill means fulfill. If you have a mortgage, the mortgage says that you have to pay the mortgage. You pay the mortgage. Once you finish paying the mortgage, do you continue to pay the mortgage? No, it's fulfilled. Matter of fact, you what? You burn the mortgage. You get rid of it. Now, has the law of the mortgage changed? No, your relationship to that law has changed. That is what we're looking at here. Jesus declared to Israel that he is the fulfillment of the law. So how did he fulfill the law? He fulfilled it by keeping God's judicial and moral law perfectly. By being the embodiment of everything the ceremonial laws, types, and symbols pointed to. The Old Testament points to Christ. When Jesus was on the Emmaus road, he talked to the men on the road. He said he taught them from the, the law and the prophets, and he taught them about himself. And when they heard about the Messiah from the Old Testament, they said, didn't our hearts burn? So the next time you're reading the Old Testament and you're about to let off a big snore, remember you're reading it the wrong way. You read the Old Testament not to try to be like Daniel, not to try to be like Joseph. You read the Old Testament to see Jesus. And when you see Jesus in the Old Testament, I guarantee you your heart's going to burn. When you see Jesus in Joseph, because Joseph was, he, he was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He was set aside by, he was betrayed by his brothers. Wasn't Jesus betrayed by his own? David, you are not David. I am not David. Jesus Christ is David. We are the army that's afraid of Goliath. That's us. But people will make movies saying, you got to fight the giants in your life. You don't have to fight them. God will fight them. Didn't Jesus, the Lord said, I will fight your battle. So therefore, David represents Jesus in that he is the rock that took the rock himself and destroyed death, hell, sin, and the grave all by himself. And now we can celebrate with him. Mm. Then Jesus stated, when the law will pass away. Verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away. Not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. God's law is inerrant, holy, and good. We're not casting aside the law. I hope, I hope you hear me this morning. I'm not saying the law is no good. No, the law is holy. It is perfect. And it will stand until the appointed day Christ eternally judges the unrighteous. Lord willing, next week you're going to see that the law is not for the righteous. The Bible clearly says that. The law is not for the righteous, but that's not for this week. That's for next week. Now, the Ten Commandments are divided into three categories. What are they? Judicial, moral, ceremonial. The judicial law 
represents our relationship to God, how we are to honor God. The moral law is how we are to honor one another. I was taught that the, there were only two, the judicial and the moral, but there is a third, the ceremonial. Now, we must remember the Ten Commandments were given exclusively to Israel. And as I've said before, he didn't give it to the Jebusites, the Hivites, any other eye, he gave it. He didn't even give it to us as Gentiles. If you look in the New Testament, here's a challenge. Show me in the New Testament where Gentiles were commanded to keep the seventh day Sabbath. If you do that, I will stand here and confess that I was wrong and didn't know what I'm talking about. But I sort of have an idea what I'm talking about. Because the word of God is true. God has never, he has never commanded Gentiles. He's commanded Gentiles to worship him as God. And what he stresses is how we treat our bodies in relationship to him. We are the temple of God. God wants us to live our lives holy, pleasing, and acceptable to him. This is how we honor God. Let's look at the judicial commandments. Beginning in Exodus 20, verse 2, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Who did he bring out of Egypt? Israel. God gave the law, the law of Moses, the law of Moses for Israel. He never gave it for Gentiles. Verse 3 you shall have no other gods before me. You say, Dana, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. There should be no other God before God. That's what Romans 1 verses 18 and on talks about. People refuse to worship God as God and he gave them over to a reprobate mind. Let's look at the second commandment. It's found in Exodus 20 verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Verse five, for you shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. God is the only one who can be jealous because he alone created Everything. He owns a cow on a thousand hills. Matter of fact, he owns you and he owns me. And, Matt, and now get this. He owns the sinner also. Because he made them in his likeness. God can be jealous. Oprah said, look, I can't I can't believe you're jealous. I can't serve a God like that. Well, I can't serve a God like that. And you serve a God like that because you understand that God is holy. The angels don't stand around the throne going love, love, love. They say what? Holy, holy, holy. Meaning he is separate other than there's none like him. And our God who took nothing, made everything, is jealous over that. He does everything for his glory. Back to verse 5 of Exodus 20. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, we got to explain this. I've got to stop and explain this. There's a trend in churches to talk about generational curses. And some people believe that God, if your father and mother had a particular sin, that he will punish you for that sin or that generation. That is not true. What he's saying here, that if the children commit the very same sins the parents do, he will judge the children just as he did the parents. You see the difference? A lot of people get scared. Well, my daddy did this. My mama did this. Well, I'm under a curse. Newsflash, we are all under a curse. It is the curse of sin. There is only one generational curse, and it is the curse of sin. But Jesus Christ died on the cross, and the word says that curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why did he hang on a tree? So that you and I, by grace, through faith, could be released from the curse. Amen. 
Just preach the gospel and people will be set free. Verse 6. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, the second commandment talks about not having any graven images. You know, there's a church that has a bunch of bells and smells. You know what I'm talking about? Ding, ding, ding. And the incense. And what do they have lined across the walls? Images. Idols. So-called Christian churches. You go into a Buddhist temple or you go Hindu, you'll see all that. But in so-called Christian churches, they will have statues of people that genuflecting before and they're bowing down and lighting candles. I'm here to tell you, that dumb statue can't do anything for you. It can't do a thing for you. Because someone had to make that statue. There is no person on the face of the earth you have to pray to. Matter of fact, you don't even have to pray to Mary. Mary can't do a thing for you. She had to get saved herself. Amen. She was born in sin. I don't care what the Catholic Church says. She was born in sin just as everybody else. And you do not get to God through Mary. You get to God through Jesus Christ. He is the only mediator. The third commandment, verse seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished or guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, taking the Lord's name in vain just not, does not mean putting his name before a cuss word. It means that you make a promise to do something by God and you don't do it. It also means attributing things to God that he never said. And a lot of these preachers on TV do that. The Lord told me, bless God, that you're going to be healed, that you're going to. No, that's taking the Lord's name in vain because the Lord never told him a thing. Didn't tell him a thing. All they want to do is put God's name on it so you can put your name on your check with their name on it. Amen. So we looked at the three judicial laws. And the punishments associated with them. Let's look at the moral laws, beginning in verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Man, that beats me up right there. Those are right there. I, I, I used to look at that and go, what the world? How, how, how in the world? Then Jesus come along and says that if you even look at a woman, you've already committed adultery. Oh, man. See, the law does not bring life. The law brings death. That's what Paul said. The law brings death to our self-righteousness so that we might look to the only one who is righteous so that we might be saved. The final commandment, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is also repeated in 1 Timothy 6, 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. All of these moral laws, there's nothing wrong with these laws. They apply today. We'll see, Lord willing, next week how they apply to us today. <clears throat> but now we come to the fourth commandment, which is a commandment all to itself. And it reads in verse eight. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is the only commandment that says remember. Why did he tell Israel to remember? Remember. They were in a land for 400 years where they did not worship God. They were surrounded by ungodly people. They were ungodly themselves. So he said, remember. But some denominations said, well, see, it's the only commandment God said, remember. That means he wants us all to remember it. No, the only thing God told us to do to remember is his blood that was shed for us on the cross and his body, which is the bread that we take when we come around the Lord's Supper. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Verse nine, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Verse 10, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner or stranger who stays with you. Verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I believe it. 
is the truth. God set it aside. He set it aside for Israel. Abraham never kept the Sabbath. Adam and Eve never kept the Sabbath. There is nowhere in scripture where you see in it who walked with God and was taken away. He was, he did not keep the Sabbath. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Did God, I asked this last week, but did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they did not keep the Sabbath? No, but he destroyed Israel because they did not keep his Sabbaths. Now, what sets the fourth commandment apart from judicial and the moral law we see here? The fourth commandment was the first of the ceremonial laws given to Israel. It was the first ceremonial law. Now, you might say, Danny, you're going on and on with this. Yeah, I am. Because it's important. Because when you understand the word of God and its true intent, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. God himself made it abundantly clear that the fourth commandment was the first of the ceremonial laws. Let's go to Leviticus 23 verse 1. The Lord spoke again to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, who are the sons of Israel? They are the direct descendants of Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So this was for people who were direct physical descendants of Jacob. Verse two again, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, the Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy Convocations, holy convocations, that's important. My appointed times are these. Verse 3 of Leviticus 23. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. What does he call the seventh day Sabbath? A holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. After that, God then lists all the other ceremonial laws. Verse 4, these are the appointed times of the Lord. What did he call them? Holy convocations. The very same thing he called the Sabbath, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. Verse 5, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Verse six, then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Now I've made a list of all the holy convocations listed in Leviticus 23. There is the Sabbath, Passover, feast of unleavened bread, feast of first fruits, feast of Pentecost, feast of trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Booths. You keep any of those? No. No, why? Because Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. And Jesus Christ, all of these, the Sabbath, Passover, all of them pointed to Christ. New covenant believers are no longer required to observe these days, not because the law has changed, but because they have been fulfilled and our relationship to them has changed. How do we know this? Colossians 2 verse 13. Now it's about to get good. When you, you who, Gentiles, here in Colossians, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Yes, he did minister to Jews. He would preach to Jews. They would reject him. Then he says, all right, I'm kicking the dust off my feet and I'm going over here. And the Gentiles rejoiced when they heard the message. And I pray today that you rejoice when you hear the message. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you Gentile, every one of every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven all your transgressions. Verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt 
consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, this is where things get twisted. I heard people say God nailed the law to the cross. The law was not nailed to the cross. It was our indebtedness. It was the debt the law required that was nailed to the cross. Why? Because Jesus took it all upon himself and he took on your debt. He took on your debt. He took on your debt. I don't want to forget anybody back. He took on your debt and he took on mine. And he was nailed to the cross. Verse 16. Therefore, because he took on our debt, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival. Food or drink, meaning you can have a ham sandwich. Leviticus 11 says you shouldn't eat. I grew up saying, people say, oh, no, if you're going to be a true Christian, you got to follow Leviticus 11. Okay, if you want to follow Leviticus 11, let's get some lambs. Let's get some goats. Let's not, anybody in here wearing uh, clothes of mixed fabric, you got a little cotton, you got a little, huh? If you're going to do some of it, you got to do all of it. But he was nailed to the cross for all of it. Again, verse 16, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival, meaning Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles and all those listed in Leviticus 23 or a new moon. Every month there were sacrifices required or what? A Sabbath day, the fourth commandment. The law hasn't changed. Our relationship to the law has changed. Because he, Christ fulfilled the law and we are now in him. We don't have to look to the law. We're not waiting for him to come. He has already come. He came in the flesh. He died so that now we might rest in him. And finally, verse 17. All of those are things which are a mere shadow of what is. And one version says what was to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, who are we hoping for? Jesus Christ. He already came the first time to save us from our sin. He saved us from the penalty of sin. And every day he is saving us from the power of sin. But we're still looking for him. He is still the substance of our faith. Because he said one day I'm a coming. And when I come, I'm going to get rid of death. I'm going to get rid of sorrow. I'm going to get rid of sickness. I'm going to get rid of separation. And we're going to live eternally with him with new bodies. No, no need for Weight Watchers. No need for the Minute Clinic. No need for anybody talking about. Oh, I got a bursitis and I got a little pain here. There will be no pain. He will do away with it all and we will live eternally in total perfection in Christ Jesus. As he is, so shall we be. Remember after he got up, he was able to walk through walls and eat a fish breakfast. <laughs> Our God. Our God has destined that we will be like Christ. Separation. Death is the separation of the body, the spirit from the body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Oh, but I'm here to tell you, one day the trump of God will sound. And when that trump sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise. And those who remain in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Jana, what kind of change are you talking about? I'm trying to talk about the perfect kind of change. When you will cry no more. This is our blessed hope. The Sabbath is not our hope. So until that time, we rest in what Christ has already done. I don't keep a Passover. Why? Because God has guaranteed through Jesus Christ, when the death angel comes, he's going to pass over us. Why? Jesus paid it all. Jesus is our unleavened bread. There was no sin in him. Jesus is the feast of weeks. We're going to worship him not just for a week, but forever and ever and ever <laughs> and ever. You don't need a Sabbath. What you need is Jesus. The substance of our faith. Sunday is not the Sabbath. 
And the true Sabbath is not a day. Father, we thank you for the revelation from your scripture. Lord, we thank you that in Christ we have perfect peace and there can be no peace without rest. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to Christ who is our Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, that everything is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Lord, we understand that we are not to live as though we are lawless. We understand that sin is transgression of the law. Well, we're thankful that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. And Lord, I pray that as we continue the study, we will have an understanding of what that means, not just for our knowledge, but that you would be glorified in how we live our lives. We thank you, Father. We praise you for your coming again. Lift up the trumpet. Loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Oh, Jesus saves. May we proclaim it to those who do, do not know you. May we not be ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power. It is your power unto righteousness. And we praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.